Happy Sabbath, everyone. Oh, come on, guys. We can do better than that. The sun's shining. Happy Sabbath, everyone. God is good. Amen. All the time. Yeah. The response is all the time. Let's try that again. God is good. And all the time. How about this one? God is awesome. Okay, even heard this one. All right. If I say God is awesome, you've got to say, yes, He is. All right? Let's give that a go. God is awesome. Yes, He is. Yes, he is. Good. You know, I, um, I'm, I'm not a preacher, okay? I, I'm, I'm a business person. So I studied business. I worked in business. Um, and now I work with ADRA. Uh, so I get a bit nervous when I get behind the pulpit because it's, it's not my natural orientation. So wherever I go, I, I like to throw things out. And what this does, it, it, it's a greeting, but it also, it also helps settle things for me here. So you, you know, praise God for this big pulpit thing out here because you can't actually see my legs. I'm actually shaking like anything. But um, yeah, I share this wherever I go. And I remember a few years ago, I was doing some work in Indonesia. And uh, they asked me to preach. And I said, yeah, OK, I'll, I'll preach, um, providing you have a translator. Because they, they couldn't understand anything that I said. They don't understand English. So what did I do? I said, well, I still have to settle myself. I'll stay true to what I do, and I'll, I'll throw out a happy Sabbath, and a uh, God is good. And fair enough, they responded. They said, happy Sabbath. I said, God is good. They said, Allah died. All the time, God is good. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't the best English, but it's funny how you can go to these countries all around the world, and this has become part of their church as well. It's encultured within the church. My name is, as I've been introduced already, Matthew Salinger. I'm married to Fale Salinger, who's sitting somewhere in the middle there. Um, and I'm from ADRA, New Zealand. I'm the CEO of ADRA. I've been recently appointed. Started the role in January this year. And um, I'm just so excited to be back home and serving in a ministry that I'm absolutely passionate about. And while I'm new to the work of ADRA in New Zealand, I'm not new to the work of ADRA. Uh, before joining ADRA New Zealand, I worked for ADRA at the division office in Sydney, and I worked there for seven years. So I'm, I'm quite familiar with the work, and um, it's just an incredible ministry of the church. Seeing it's the uh, 150th year anniversary of our church, I thought I'd share a little bit about our history. I went to our union office in, in Harwick, Auckland, uh, last week, and I was quite disappointed that they had all these different banners you know, representing the history of our church from when we started to, to health and, and education and all these banners, but there was nothing there to portray Adra's journey. So I want to share a little bit about that journey now. We started in 1956. Do you know what our name was back then? SOARS. Who's familiar with the word SOARS? It's an acronym, the Seventh-day Adventist welfare service. And that's what we became. Um, back then, we were a very basic operation. We would just provide food parcels and assistance to communities in need, um, especially during times of war and conflict and uh, during times of disasters. In 1983, the church came together and they said, you know, we have this ministry that goes out there and it meets the needs of people, but are we actually meeting their needs through the right way possible? So they had this little review, and they, they, what they discovered is that we should actually be providing development-type services, not welfare assistance. So the emphasis changed. The focus changed. And that's when we became ADRA. In 1983, we became the Adventist Development and Relief Organization of the Church, with a specific focus on developing communities so they can then be more self-sustainable, more self-sufficient. You know, I have this policy. I will work with you in your country, providing I don't have to see you again in five years, or at all. Meaning, if we did our jobs correctly the first time, we wouldn't have to see these people again. Sounds very unchristian, but that's what development is. It's about ensuring that we've, we've given them the right help possible so they can then kick on with their life. Since then, it's now, what, 2013, where I think this is our 30th year anniversary, this year or next year, we're approaching it. And um, I'm proud to say that, you know, as a ministry, 
you know, we've grown to over 125 different countries around the world. You know, this little ministry of ADRA, you know, we're a humble ministry. We're not really known in the media, but we're in 125 countries around the world. And just to give you some perspective, last year alone, we supported over 31 million people. Now, I've only been back in New Zealand for a few months now, but, you know, the population is around 4, 4, 4 million, just a tad a bit over that. But that's a, quite a few New Zealands within that. That's how many people we supported. So God has really blessed our ministry, and so he should. You know, as Adventists, we know that we're living in the end of days, and we know these things are happening. We see them all the time. We, I've noticed over the last few years that there have been so many tsunamis and earthquakes just happening around the world, so much conflict. And as uh, we grow closer to that time, there will be more need for this ministry of our church. This morning, I'd also like to uh, say thank you. Now, thank you for you for supporting our ministry here in New Zealand. You know, since coming to New Zealand, I've learned that um, you know, pretty much everything that we do is only made possible through the generosity of our church. Now, we, uh, we have a great relationship with the New Zealand government, and I'm proud to stand here before you and say um, we are their, I've got to say this right, not their highest funded organisation, but we have the most contracts with the New Zealand government when it comes to international aid. And there's a reason for that. It's because we do really good work. But the only reason why we're able to access those, those funds, those contracts, is because they also require a match. They require us to match the funding that they put forward to us. And we're able to do that through the generosity of our church supporters right here in New Zealand. We are 12,000 Adventists, and because of you, you make a lot of our work possible. So I'd like to thank you for your financial contributions. I'd like to thank you for your efforts on the edge of appeal. And I'd also like to thank you for your prayers, because your prayers are so much needed within our ministry, and please continue to pray for us. In fact, let's pray right now before I preach. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, as I stand here before you, with my brothers and sisters from Whangarei Church, Lord, I just want to give you all the praise, all the glory, Lord, for being such a loving and, and merciful Father, Lord. Lord, I pray, Lord, that as I speak from your word, Lord, that I just become your mouthpiece this morning. So I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to rain upon us and to pour blessings, Lord. And uh, just bear with me, your humble servant, as I share your message. Amen. This morning's sermon is titled... Words, oh, Actions and Words. Actually, I got that wrong. It was words and actions last night. You should never prepare your sermons late at night. Okay, no, not the finishing touches, that is. So the real title was words and actions. Who knows what I'm talking about here? I'm talking about matching what comes out of your mouth with the expressions of our hands and feet. Now, I'm talking about some of the old sayings that you know very well, such as, why don't you walk the talk? Familiar with that one? How about this one? Actions speak louder than words. And one of my favorite ones is, come on, don't tell me, show me. Who's heard of this before? Put up your hand. Okay. Put up your hand if you've actually said this to someone before. <laughs> That's quite funny then. I noticed that more females put their hands up than males, but when I said, who has heard this before, they had all put their hands up. So I'm assuming, because my wife put her hand up too, so she's guilty of this, that this is you telling your husbands to walk the talk. Actions speak louder than words. This morning's sermon is based on the book of Mark. And I love the book of Mark, because the book of Mark is a book that uh, portrays Christ as a man of action, as a servant God. It depicts... Christ's ministry in his early years. And this morning as we study through the book of Mark, I want to share some important characteristics of Christ's ministry. But before I do that, we need to define what this word ministry is, because this is our starting point. So when I first asked myself the question, I said, hey, Matt, this is easy. You know, I'm a born and raised Adventist, did the Pathfinder thing, ever went to Avondale College. So I sat down, quite confident that I can write a really good definition of ministry. Got into it. Within two minutes, I had a statement. And then I thought, no, hang on, well, I'm forgetting something. So then I had to add that bit in. 
But it's also about this thing here. Then I had to write this bit in. After a few minutes, I had several statements that encompassed this word ministry. So I, I gave up with words. It, I discovered it was a lot more complex than I thought. And I said, look, I'm a visual person. Um, let's, let's draw it. I'll draw a diagram of what I think ministry is. And I'm not an artist. But I came up with this. I'm clearly not an artist. Me, you, people, and God. What's our role in that whole flow, flow chart there? We connect people with God. And then I thought, but how? Simply through sharing the love of God. I claim to the simple definition that ministry is this one thing right here. Connecting people with God through sharing the love of God. Which brings me to my first point. Ministry is about sharing the love of God. And when you share the love of God, it isn't just about preaching and teaching. You know, it's not just about the word or words. You know, I grew up in a church. I grew up in a church in Christchurch. And... Um, you know, we were really big on the Word. We were such a busy church. Wednesday night prayer meetings, Friday night vespers, all-day Sabbath program. When I say all-day, I'm meaning we started with Sabbath school and we finished with closing Sabbath. And I don't know how we did it, but we filled everything in between. And then somehow we managed to squeeze in Bible studies throughout the week. And that was all good. I'm not complaining. It was great. I loved it. But it didn't leave too much time to do anything else. And sharing the love of God is more than just word or words. It's holistic. It's words and it's action. I went to a uh, Catholic school growing up. I, I, my, my parents are Samoan and um, they migrated in the, in the early 70s. And, and they had all of us in New Zealand. And um, I guess their thinking was, you know, because it was the missionaries that came to these countries and established schools and social services, um, and the Catholics were really onto it when it came to that. They thought the only good schools that, that existed were the Catholic ones. So that's where they sent us. And uh, at Catholic school, you learn about all the saints, and uh, I learned about this saint right here. Do you know who this person is? Francis of Assisi, that's right. And he once said uh, the statement that stuck with me ever since. Preach the gospel at all times. And if necessary, use words. Pretty profound. It's pretty straight to the point. I get it. You know, it's, if you are to preach the gospel, do it through yourself. When people see Jesus, let them see it through you, through your actions, through the, your words, through the way you live your life. That's what he's saying. In the book of Mark, there is a pattern to Christ's ministry. And I analyzed this pattern. And uh, this morning, I just want to share with you just the first chapter alone. Now, Christ's ministry starts from verse 14. And just from verse 14 to verse 35, there's what? 45, there's 31 texts there. But what it says, it says, Jesus preaches, then he teaches, then he teaches, and then he heals, then he preaches, then he heals. Now, if you analyze the rest of the book of Mark in that way, that pattern continues. Chapter after cha chapter, Jesus preaches, he teaches, he heals, he meets the needs of the people. This is the ministry that Christ had. The two went hand in hand. He didn't separate it. And, it, and this analysis isn't random events that came together. This was Christ's day-to-day -day ministry. And this is the ministry that he requires of us today. In Mark 1 verse 29 it says, As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with John, James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever. As soon as they left the synagogue, they were gone to meet the needs of the people. In Mark 1 verse 39 it says, So he travelled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. As I said, the two happened Hand in hand. You know, I stand here before you as a brother in Christ, you know, from, from down the line in Auckland. 
Um, so being a brother in Christ, I feel as though I can be as honest with you as possible, right? So I want to ask you an honest question. Is this what ministry looks like in our church today? Do we have a church here that preaches and teaches, but also with the other hand, we're out there meeting the needs of our community? Because as defined earlier, this is the ministry that God did. This is what sharing the love of God is about. Are we doing this? Some of you may recall that in 2009 there was an earthquake off the coast of Samoa. As a result of that, there was a tsunami that hit the nation. Over 180 people lost their lives. ADRA, among many other agencies, came in to support the, uh, the relief effort. And uh, what we did in Samoa is that we all sat around a table and we pretty much allocated clusters or villages to different agencies. ADRA was given three villages, three regions. When we finished uh, our work in those three regions, we were saying goodbye. The chiefs got together and they had a meeting. And then they approached the, uh, they requested a meeting with the president of our mission in Samoa. And they said, Pastor, now we've always known about your church. To be honest, we've, we think your church is kind of strange. You know, you worship on Saturday, and while well, everyone worships on Sunday here in Samoa. But we've seen the love of God through your hands. When we needed you most, you came to our rescue. You came and helped rebuild our community, our village. And that was your church. So I want you to come and build a church right here in our community so we can worship with you, worship your God. Praise God, huh? Now this story is just a classic example of what happens when you go out there and you meet the emotional and physical needs of the community. As soon as you do that, something happens. They become open, open to you to meet their spiritual needs. The second point I want to share with you this morning it's called the flow-on effect. Becoming God's love in action has a flow-on effect that brings more people to God. I just want to share with you, I can't read it there. I just want to share with you a story from the book of Mark. This is Mark chapter 5. Some of you may recall the story of the demon-possessed man who uh, was possessed by a legion of demons. And uh, I'll, I'll recap the story. It's too small for us to read. Uh, pretty much, you know, Jesus comes off the boat. He crosses the Sea of Galilee. And um, he's walking along the, the, the beach. And then a uh, demon-possessed man sees him and starts running towards Jesus. He gets on his knees and he shrieks. He screams with a loud voice. He said, Jesus. He says, I've got to get these words right. He says, Jesus, why are you interfering with me? In the name of God, I beg you, don't torture me. You see, as soon as this man saw Jesus, and Jesus saw him, Jesus had already commanded that the demons leave this man. So Jesus speaks with the demons. He says, so what is your name? The demons responded, my name is Legion, because there are many of us dwelling within this man. And then the demons go on and they start begging Jesus. They say, Jesus, please, you know, have mercy on us. Don't, don't send us to a far off distant land. Cast us into those pigs that are on the near, nearby hillside so that's what Jesus does he sends those demons into the pigs into 2,000 pigs and as a result of that the pigs came right off the hillside and into the ocean now many people saw what happened they witnessed that a lot of the shepherds and they went to their, their surrounding uh, neighborhoods and they, they shared what had happened with everyone and the remaining people that gathered around Jesus and this man they saw that you know, this man that was demon-possessed, he was now clothed and he was seen and he was, he was talking with real sentences. And they got really scared. They were terrified because they were thinking, who is this man standing before us that has done this to this demon-possessed man but has killed all these pigs? And they pleaded with Jesus and they said, Jesus, leave us. Please leave us alone. Jesus just got off the boat and they're telling him to leave. 
So Jesus leaves. And as we read the rest of the book of Mark 5, all the way to chapter 8, what my studies have revealed is that uh, Jesus did a bit of traveling. So the, the big dot there is, uh, is, is where he started. He then went to Capernaum, where he brought a, a girl back to life. He then made his way to Nazareth, where he, he heals and performs many miracles. It's also the place, and as we read in the Bible, where he made that statement that no prophet will be accepted in their hometown. Then he makes his way back to Capernaum, where he meets with his disciples, and he commissions them. Tells them to go out there to teach, to heal, to meet the needs of people. Then he boards a boat, makes his way to Bethsaida. When he gets there, there's 5,000 people there waiting for him. So he feeds them spiritually, but as we know, he also feeds the 5,000. He feeds them physically. Then he makes his way to Genesaret, where he does some more healing. Then to Tyre, where he casts out a demon from a young girl. And then to Sidon, where he does some more healing. And then finally, he makes his way back to Decapolis. Waiting for Jesus as he arrives? 4,000 people. 4,000 people were waiting to see Jesus. And as you read in Mark chapter 8, it says, they then stayed with Jesus for the next three days as they listened to him speak and share. Now I've got a question for you. How did this happen? Remember, he was, last time he was in the region, they said, Jesus, leave us, please. We don't want you here. He returns within three chapters in the book of Mark, and they're there welcoming him with open arms, 4,000 of them, and they hang with this guy for three days. How does this happen? By the way, the couple is, is, a, is a Gentile region. They're non-believers. How does this happen? Sure, we can, we can, we can, we can make an assumption that they heard the good stories, the good news from Capernaum, from Genesaret, from Nazareth, and Sidon. And then they got really keen. But I think we need to go back and revisit what Christ did and what he said just before he left the last time he was there. And this is what he said. It's found in Mark 5, verse 19 to 20. After he performed this miracle, the demon-possessed man comes up to Jesus and says, Jesus, I want to come with you. Jesus says, no. He said, go home to your family and friends and tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. So then the man started off to visit the ten towns of that region and began to proclaim the great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed at what he told them. You see, this man, this man was so moved by what Jesus had done in his life that although Christ had instructed him, he said, look, just go and share it with your friends and family. He couldn't. Now, he went to the ten towns of Decapolis, the, the, the Gentile region, and he shared about this man that had changed his life. And people just got interested in that because, because who was this man who could do this to you? That could absolutely transform you into this new being. Church, bring God's love and action will create a flow and effect in bringing more people to God. It is the greatest and most easiest form of witnessing, in fact, the most strategic form of witnessing too. Now, while our deeds may be discreet, you know, it could be helping out a, a, a single mother on your street or taking a, a tro troubled youth you know, under your wing, people will notice that. You know, we live in a society today, a secular society, where everything is about self. Everything is about me. There is nothing in there that, that is about others. So if you start helping people, you start meeting their needs, people will open their eyes and they'll see something. And they'll start asking questions, you know, why? How? You know, what's in it for you? Why are you helping this menace to society, this troubled young man that's caused all these issues? Why? They'll even ask the same questions to that young man, to that person who you supported. They said, why? You know, there must be something going on here. 
And in the process of questioning, a seed will be planted. You know what that seed was? That seed is, you know, those Christian people, they're pretty good people. Are these people from the Adventist church? Wow. They're really loving. There's something really in this guy, I think. You know, when I was in, um, I've been to Africa, when I was in Africa, I, I went to a number of different countries and um, as I was doing work there, I was just amazed at how well, how church has, has, um, for lack of a better word, has have just won so many souls. You know, I was working in Malawi, 400,000 Adventist members in Malawi, a country of only 15 million people, yet 400,000 Adventists. You know, that, it was hard to compute that in my mind. You know, I was in Australia and we had 52,000 Adventist members in Australia. Only 30,000 of them go to church regularly. But that's a country of 20 million people. In you know, New Zealand, to put this in the New Zealand context, 4 million Kiwis of a church of 12,000 people. Regular attendees, 5 to 6,000. So I'm absolutely amazed at, at how many Adventists we have in these countries in Africa? You know, Zambia, 20 million Adventists, half a million people. You know, Kenya, 850,000 Adventists. And these numbers are just, you know, they've just really got me asking questions. And I realized the reason why the work has gone so far and has gone so wide in these countries in Africa is because these people have seen Christ's heart. They've seen God's love through the services of our education ministry, through the services of our health ministry. You know, we have clinics all over Africa through the services of ADRA. Now, I remember jumping in an ADRA vehicle, they see the ADRA logo. And the ADRA logo is pretty simple. Right? It's the ADRA and the three people holding hands around the world. But they only say one thing. They say the Adventists. I go in the community, hey, Matthew, from the Adventists. Yeah, yeah, that school has a name. It's called, you know, something Christian College. But it's the Adventist school. It's the Adventist clinic. You know, by meeting the needs of your community, people will see God. The next point I want to share with you this morning is this. Sharing God's love and action is our Christian, God-given, God-commissioned responsibility. Now, a consistent message throughout Christ's ministry was this. Don't tell anyone. In Mark 1, verse 43 to 44, he says, Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See, you do not tell this to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices. This is a message God gave someone after he had healed him. In Mark 7, verse 36, Jesus commanded again, tell, don't tell anyone. But the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. Now I found this quite interesting. You know, it was quite baffling. And maybe because, you know, my, my area of expertise is in marketing and, and PR and, and things like that. So you tell a marketer, you tell a PR person, so don't share good news about something your organization has done. You know, you're dreaming. There's no way they'll let that opportunity go by. So I'm confused. You know, why would Jesus make this statement? Now, even in, um, even in Mark 5, when the demon-possessed man went and shared with the ten towns in Decapolis, let's not forget, all Jesus said to that person was, share with your friends and family. Like I said, it should be the total opposite. You know, Jesus should be going, go and tell everyone, tell the world. You know, the same way when he commissioned the, the disciples, he said, go and preach to all nations. You know, this same message should go across, but it didn't. It didn't go across because Christ is trying to teach us something. And that thing is called intention, about motives. Like Christ, God wants us to share his love because it is our responsibility to. 
It is what God requires of us, and for no other reason. That's why he put that in there, to teach us something, for no other reason. When I say no other reason, I'm meaning things such as church growth strategies. I'm talking about things such